morning, everybody. If you could grab your Bibles. If you don't have one, grab your blue Bible and turn to John chapter 6. And in the blue Bibles, it is page 1059. And I would like to ask all of the children to come forward and walk over with me to jumpstart. Uh, well, good morning. Welcome again to Jacksonville Presbyterian Church. If this is your first Sunday here, uh, we're thankful you're here. We don't believe anyone is here by accident. Uh, we're going through the Gospel of John today. We're actually entering uh, the longest chapter in John. It's John chapter 6. It's also the longest chapter in the New Testament. Uh, so with that in mind, we're going to read verses John 6, verses 1 through 15. Uh, friend, hear the word of the Lord to us this morning. I'd love for everybody to have a, a copy of God's printed word open in front of them. Uh, friend, hear the word of the Lord to us this morning in John chapter 6. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii, 200 days worth work of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to Jesus, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed it to them as they were seated. So also the fish, as much as they needed. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and to take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will endure forever. This is the word of the Lord. Be Amen. Would you be seated and keep that Bible open as we pray? Father, as we study your word, Holy Spirit, uh, would you empower us to understand and see Jesus? Uh, Father, you uh, give us tests and trials. Uh, although you are not guilty of tempting us, uh, you do let our faith be tested. And Father, we thank you that we can come to you through the power uh, that Jesus has earned for us because he passed the test for us. In his name we pray, amen. Well, as we dive into John chapter 6, this first famous story of Jesus feeding 5,000 men, uh, I want to uh, just ask you a quick question, if that's okay. Are you the kind of person that's good at tests? Are you good at tests? You know, I'm not just talking to the teenagers in the room, although I am talking to you as well. Are you good at tests? Don't you hate people who are good at tests? They're just so annoying, right? I mean, that's like the definition of a test, right? It's supposed to be hard, right? And that's what makes it a test, after all? Well, you know, when you think about tests, I don't just mean the things you did uh, when you were a teenager or when you were in school, uh, although you may still be in that world. The kind of tests I want to talk to you about this morning are the tests that we sort of go through in life, uh, the ones you never really get a grade on, uh, the kind of tests that maybe no one else ever sees how well or how poorly you do. I'm talking about the tests, you know, that are always kind of there in the background, sort of like dissonant chords in the melody of life, or they're like the white noise that you just can't seem to turn off as you go through life. You know, the kind of tests that we have of our faith, uh, of our convictions. You know, I think about the kind of tests that most people have, and I know that there are many of you in this room who are going through these kind of tests, uh, tests about health stuff. I mean, who here uh, doesn't know what it's like to have the wrong kind of diagnosis or a family member have the wrong kind of diagnosis? Uh, there's the tests of marriage, right? Uh, there are the marriage problems that no one knows except for you and your spouse. And maybe your spouse won't even admit that there's a problem. 
That preached to somebody, right? <laughs> there's the test of your career, right? All the trials, there's your coworkers, there's the boss who never really recognizes what you're doing, there's the frustration you get from your job. And of course, you know, it's a holiday season, right? So who isn't stressed out about family, right? Maybe you're lucky enough that God has given you that test this week and you're sitting next to them, right? <laughs> there's financial tests, there's family tensions. But then, you know, there's a whole other kind of test that I think people struggle with, which is when we see um, either, I see it in, when, things, when things don't go well for our kids, right? There's that kind of test. Uh, maybe you and your life, you're doing just fine, but when it affects your children, it's a whole different kind of test of your faith, isn't it? Uh, or maybe you don't have any kids, but your life is doing mildly okay, right? But you see other people really struggling, and you try to reconcile, how can a good God let other people struggle like that? I mean, I, I'm not going to complain, but friends, what I want you to do is I want you to realize that those are all sort of the tests of our faith, whether you identify them as such, they really are tests of your faith. Who is the Lord and what is he up to? And do I still really believe any of this stuff? Well, uh, if you look at John 6, I want to suggest to you that really John is telling us this story because it all hinges on a test. In fact, that's sort of the whole like big reveal of this entire story. Look at verse 6, 6. I think the whole story hinges on that one sentence right there. Uh, Jesus said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. You know, what's going on in this story is quite fascinating. Um, if you study the Bible, you'll know that there are four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, if you're a further student of the Bible, you may even know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very, very similar. And John is sort of like the black sheep to the three white sheep. He's this sort of odd bird who adds all kind of beautiful stories that no one else talks about. Uh, so when Jesus uh, creates wine at the wedding feast, no one else tells us that story. And John has a lot of stories uh, that uh, the other gospel writers left out. But what's fascinating is of all of the stories in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, the only miracle that Jesus performs that all four gospel writers tell us about, I mean, besides the resurrection, of course, but thinking about the earthly miracles, the healings, the miraculous things, the only miracle that all four gospel writers tell us the story about is this miracle. This is it. So that should tip us off that this story is especially important because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all find it important to tell us that Jesus fed 5,000. And when you study the other gospel writers, it's really fascinating because uh, you'll start to see why it's important that we have four gospels. It's pretty, it's pretty cool if you do this. You can go home and, and check it out. Like if you study the way the different gospel writers tell the story, they all add layers and complexity to the story. Uh, so for instance, when Matthew tells this story, Matthew in Matthew 14, Matthew tells us that Jesus goes away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee because he's been ministering to so many people. But then someone comes along and tells him that John the Baptist has just been killed. And deeply sorrowful, Jesus goes away by himself to grieve the loss of John the Baptist. The hard part, of course, is as Jesus leaves, the disciples come and so does a huge large crowd. And so Jesus has compassion on them and feeds them. Mark gives us another layer of complexity which is actually, Mark doesn't mention Jesus being tired. Mark tells us that actually Jesus has just sent out the 12 disciples to go heal the sick and preach the good news of the kingdom of God, the gospel. And they're so tired uh, when they come back to Jesus that Mark tells us that when they, after they go, the 12 disciples go, they come back, they are exhausted and they don't even have time to eat. You know, anyone ever work so hard you forget to eat? They're exhausted, and so the disciples come back to Jesus. They haven't even eaten lunch for a whole week, and Jesus says, you need to come rest for a while. Come away with me to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and let's go be with the Lord. John then adds another layer of complexity, which is Jesus was doing this. He knew all along that this was going to be a test for his disciples. And in fact, it's a test for everybody in this story. It's a test for the crowd. 
and it's a test for all 12 of the disciples. And here's the good news. They don't pass the test. (laughs) See, the great news of the gospel is that you and I, we don't pass the test. (laughs) We don't pass any test. Um, Who, you know, Proverbs says it this way, many a man proclaims his steadfast love, but who has purity of heart? You know, who can pass these tests? Well, so let me just kind of, kind of show you all the ways that people are sort of failing the test of faith in the story, right? So first off, let's go look at this crowd. Look at uh, John 6. Let's go into verse, uh, we'll just do verse 1, right? So Jesus goes away. Why is he going away? Well, because he's sad, but also his disciples are tired, but also so that he can test their faith and let them grow. Now, of course, Jesus goes over there, and in verse 2, it tells us a very large crowd of people were following him. But then it's very important how John defines this large group of people who are following Jesus. You know, they are following him, which is always a good thing to do, to follow Jesus, right? But there's this deep sort of undercurrent throughout John that people can follow Jesus, but not, never become true followers of Jesus. You see, this crowd is not coming to Jesus because they believe that he is the Lord come to save us all. Instead, they're doing it because he's done some signs and miracles. Look at verse 2. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Right? So Jesus is uh, going over to this other side, and people are coming not necessarily because they have faith in him, but because they just want to see something miraculous. And they further fail the test, right? Because at the end, how do they respond? They try to force him to become king, and if you remember in, later in the Gospel of John, when Jesus is on trial, literally, when Jesus goes through his trial, his test, you may remember that Pilate says, so are you a king? And Jesus says what? Well, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, do you not think they would have come and protected me? You wonder why it mentions 5,000 men in this story? Isn't that an odd mm. Is that sexist of them to mention 5,000 men? Well, Matthew and Mark, they mention the women and the children. Why does John only mention the men? Well, you have to understand that 5,000 men in this time would have constituted an army, like a Roman legion, about 5,000 men. And when Jesus has the men sit down in 50s and 100s, and he starts to show them his miraculous power, that this army can be on the move and they don't have to worry about food and logistics. Buddy, who's going to stop us now? And that's why they try to make him king. You see, John also, John only, John is really clear to tell us that this story happens around Passover. Did you catch that in verse 4? Maybe you don't think that's important. You're like, cool, Passover's a thing. I've heard of that. But it's really important. Because at Passover, thousands and thousands and thousands of Israelites would have returned to the promised land. They would have come from all over the known world, and they would have worshipped in Jerusalem. And so this may explain, for one, where did all these people come from? Well, these may have been crowds of people who were coming to Jerusalem to worship and praise the Lord at Passover. And then all these people here, wait a second, Jesus, he may be the prophet. He may be the promised king come to free us from Rome. Let's go see what he has to say. You see, the Passover for the Israelites was sort of similar to like the 4th of July. It was uh, pride in the country, and it was the hope of having their own kingdom. And you have to remember, in Jesus' time, they weren't in charge of their own kingdom. Rome was in charge. So you can see why it's so easy for these people to think Jesus has come to be a military king. And now, hey, we've got 5,000 men right now. Let's do this. Oh, he doesn't want to be a general? Well, that's just further confirmation he should be the general. He should be the king. Let's make him by force. So you see the crowd, they're not really passing the test, would you say? (laughs) They're not really seeing Jesus. Sure, they see a part of Jesus. Is Jesus the prophet that Moses said would come? Moses in Deuteronomy 18 says there'll be a prophet one day, and you better listen to him, and he's going to be better than me. And so is Jesus that prophet who's better than Moses? Absolutely. Is he the king to end all kings? Absolutely, but you don't really see him in truth yet. See, that's what John is trying to tell this crowd. You don't really get it. You're seeing parts, but you don't see what they combine to be. Right? It's like how you can see red and yellow, but unless you mix them together, you'll never see orange. Right? You can get pieces of Jesus correct, 
But unless you put all of the pieces together, you don't really see him for who he is. So that's how, the, that's how the crowd is failing the test, right? They're not really seeing what the Lord is up to. Now, of course, there are other people in the story. Don't you love that uh, John sort of rats out, you know, Philip and Andrew in this story? Not that he's ratting it out. No. This is, he's talking about his friends right now, right? And so what does Philip say when, when Jesus approaches him? You know, look at verse 5 right there. Uh, Jesus, lifting up his eyes then and seeing a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus turns to Philip and says, hey, we're going to buy all the bread to feed these people. And there's a lot of beautiful things about that in, the, in that sentence. First, that phrase, lifting up his eyes. You may remember that Jesus tells the disciples to do that in John 4. Remember when Jesus shares the gospel with the Samaritan woman? This woman who is a reject of rejects? And Jesus tells the disciples, lift up your eyes. Don't you see the harvest, the people that need to know the truth? And so Jesus doesn't despise the crowd. I mean, you may get that impression because they're such doofuses, right? They're, they're so misunderstanding what's happening. You may feel the, the sort of like the primal urge to be like, well, they're just dumb. <laughs> they're just wrong about Jesus. Thank God I'm not like the crowd, right? But that's not Jesus' response. Jesus sees these confused people who are misunderstanding what he's come to do. And Matthew says, he looked at them with compassion and he healed them. And Mark says he taught them all day. And at the end of a long day, he turns to Philip and he says, hey, how are we going to feed all these people? Where, where can we buy some bread? And why does he turn to Philip? Why is that important? Well, you know, again, these are all these little details are very sweet, right? Like the fact that the people sit on grass. Well, it's because it's springtime. That's when Passover is. Well, Jesus turns to Philip because John already told us in John chapter 1 that Philip is from this area. He's from Bethsaida. They're in his neighborhood. So he turns to Philip and he's like, hey, where's, where's the closest grocery store, bro? You know, these people are hungry. We've healed them. I've been teaching all day. They're very tired. You know, how can we, where, where do we get some food, Philip? And how does Philip respond? Well, Philip responds, you know, with a total calculating answer, right? I mean, I don't want to overdo it, but you know a lot of people like this, you know, who are like, you ask them a question and they go like automatic to like the logistical answer, right? Aren't they so much fun? Well, you know, to do it, we would need about 200 days worth of work in order to buy enough food. That's about eight months of work from one person. And oh, by the way, Jesus, even that calculation's wrong because he says that's only enough to give them a little morsel, you know, so it's not even possible right? Don't you love how analytical he is? You know, when you and I go through tests and trials, do you ever kind of revert to sort of like trying to fix the problem through analyses? Anyone think critical analysis is your spiritual gift? I do. Where's that one in second opinions, you know? I mentioned this before, you know, but my great, the greatest thing my, you know, mentor Richard White ever did uh, when I was a, a younger pastor uh, was I remember I had this huge problem and I went to my pastor and I said, what are we going to do to solve this problem? And he goes, mm, wow, mm, mm. let's pray. And I said, pray, what are you talking about? We got to solve the problem. Let's think it through. Let's Google this. There's got to be a solution somewhere. Let's crowdsource this. And he said he prayed. I mean, I see myself in Philip, right? I don't know if you do. Uh, but when you and I are going through tests and trials, it's so easy to lean, on, as Proverbs would say, right? To lean on our what? On our own understanding, right? Philip is leaning on his own understanding. He's looking at the test, and he's not really passing the test, right? And don't you love that? Uh, you know, I wish I, I, you could put that in like brackets or a little parentheses mark, because uh, verse 6-6 six, six is sort of John telling you what the story is about, Right? There's this impossible problem, and everybody's tired. Everybody's cranky. They haven't eaten. Remember, Mark tells us they haven't eaten. Right? And now they have to go take a hike to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and then there are all these people, and they just want us to feed them? You just send them away, Jesus? Just send them away. You've done good. We've done enough. But Jesus is doing this to test us. And I think that's important to remember. Because I can guarantee you one thing, and that is, if you're going through a test, it is not convenient. I mean, your health diagnosis, your marriage problems, 
your career problems? Did it come at a convenient time? No, the tests come often when we're tired and we're exhausted and we're a little cranky. And we just sort of want to be done with people. Don't you love people? I mean, hate people? <laughs> Starting to get to know y'all, right? <laughs> Life would be a lot easier if it wasn't for all these other people around. Just send them away, Jesus. We can't possibly solve this problem. You know, I love Andrew, uh, his, his next response, because I think Andrew, um, he doesn't pass the test. But remember, passing the test, that's not really the point right now. The point is you got to see that these are all sort of tests. So Philip doesn't pass because he thinks just too calculatingly. He, just, he doesn't factor in who he's talking to, right? Well, Andrew responds. Let's see how Andrew responds in verse 8. You know, one of these other disciples, as John points out, one of the other disciples, Andrew, uh, Simon Peter's brother, said to Jesus, well, here's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? And there's a lot of beautiful things in that uh, sentence to really, really appreciate. Uh, the first one is only John tells us they're barley loaves, and barley uh, was famously the poorest of the poor food. You know, it's like, uh, hey, Jesus, there's nothing to eat. Hey, I found some like five cold ramen noodle bowl bowls. <laughs> You know, and I found some white bread that's sure to be terrible for us. Does that count? You know, and I don't think he means it sarcastically. I don't, I don't think he's being disrespectful to Jesus. I think what he's showing us is sort of the way out, right? Uh, what, he's showing us how to respond to the test, right? And what he's basically saying is he's saying, Jesus, well, here's what we've got, but what is this to so many? And I think there's something really beautiful about that. Uh, Andrew doesn't know what Jesus is about to do. He doesn't know how Jesus is going to solve the problem. But what he does say in this beautiful, beautifully profound way is he says, well, I'll give you what I can give you. You know, I don't know if this is enough, but let me just at least give you something. And I think really that's sort of the key to understanding this passage. Because then Jesus performs the miracle. Right? He says, have the people sit down, and it's Passover, it's springtime. So they sit on the beautiful grass, and Jesus miraculously gives them bread and fish. But what I want you to focus in on for Andrew is just, I think Andrew is our example in this story. Because faced with this really hard test, faced with this big trial, he comes and he says, well, I don't have a lot, but here's what I've got. And I think when people face trials and tests, I think, you know, like the, the natural tendency is to think, I don't have enough faith. I'm just like not strong enough. I don't even know if I believe this stuff about Jesus to even get through this. I don't know if I, I, don't know if I have enough faith to get through. I don't know if I believe God is actually seeing us with what we're dealing with. But friends, what I want to suggest to you and to your thinking is um, faith is like a spark. And God can take a little spark and turn it into a wildfire. I mean, think about it. How, how, you know, how big does a spark have to be to cause a wildfire? The spark doesn't have to be very big. Uh, Jesus is constantly trying to challenge his disciples to say, give me even the little bit of faith that you have and see what I can do with even just a little spark. So if you're struggling in your marriage or in a health diagnosis, or something with your kids. You think, I, don't, I just don't have a lot left in the tank. We just got to give him whatever you have. And see what the Lord can do with a spark. Now you may know the story of Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. Now, if you don't know Jim famously, you know, in, infamously, uh, was a missionary to Ecuador. Uh, you may know the story he was famously killed in the 1950s. Uh, he tried to preach the gospel to a tribe in Ecuador. He got there, and famously, he was killed. Uh, Jim, Jim's from Portland, if you don't know that. He grew up in Portland. And his wife at the time, a woman named Elizabeth, uh, the, the beautiful thing about the story, of course, is if you know the story or if you've seen the movie End of the Spear, you'll know that Elizabeth, his wife, goes back to the tribe that murdered Jim, and she ends up moving in and living with them and sharing the forgiveness of Jesus Christ to them. And the people who murdered her husband end up becoming her brothers and sisters in Christ. 
You think she's got something to teach us about enduring tests? When it's really, really hard to see why God would let this happen. Why would God let a 28-year-old missionary die? Listen to how Elizabeth Elliot responds. This is a quote from Elizabeth later on. She says, if the only thing you have to offer is a broken heart, you offer a broken heart. So in a time of grief, the recognition that this is material for sacrifice has been very important to me. Realizing that I have nothing and nothing that I am will be refused by Christ. I simply give it to Jesus as the little boy gave his five loaves and two fish. With the same feeling of the disciples when they said, what is the good of that for such a crowd? Uh, I don't know why uh, you're going through the tests that you're going through. Um, I don't know why I have to go through the tests that I'm going through. I don't know why the things happen to our kids that do. Uh, I don't want to give you answers to those questions, but I want to give you sort of two responses to it, if that makes sense. These aren't explanations as to why. When you and I encounter tests, um, God doesn't tempt us, but he will put us through tests. Uh, The first sort of response as to why you're going through it is what if the test, what if the test is meant to bring you closer to the Lord than it is to explain why it's happening? I mean, think about it this way. Um, If you have a child or a grandchild or a niece or a nephew and they're heartbroken and they're um, extremely sad and they're weeping, um, you don't try to reason with them. You don't try to say, well, honey, you broke your leg because you jumped out of a two-story window which is a bad idea. No, what you do when a child is heartbroken, part of what it means to be a father, right, is you take the heartbroken child and you put it up against your heart and you let your slow heartbeat affect theirs to where the two hearts are beating in unison. That's what it means to be a father. So what if this test and this trial you're going through, and what if you're never gonna know why? But what if this was an invitation for you to get closer to the heartbeat of your father? Second response, not an explanation. First one is, what if this is an invitation to grow closer to the Lord, to trust him? Is what if the test you're facing now and the trial you're facing now, what if it's preparation for an even greater test? in an even greater trial. And God is going to strengthen your weak knees and strengthen your arms so that you can handle the real test which is coming. I mean, after all, isn't the great test where we all pass from this life to the next? I mean, you know it's coming, right? (laughs) What if the test you're going through now is an opportunity to learn how to trust the Lord through thick and thin? What if that's what this test is for? You know, Paul goes on in Romans, you can turn there, in Romans 5, Paul says this about the stuff we have to suffer in the test. He says, we rejoice when we have to suffer, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. See, what Paul says is the tests, the trials, the sufferings, the disappointments, those are all meant to give you character and give you endurance. Because there's going to be an even greater trial that we're all going to have to face. So do do people pass the test in the story? No, I don't really think that's the point. You know, in verse 15, after Jesus performs the miracle, which he literally did, I don't understand when people don't believe in miracles. Jesus does miracles. He's God after all. I mean, it's like, if you believe in God, how do you not believe in miracles? That's like like saying, I believe in the internet, but emails are just metaphorical. (laughs) If I believe in the internet, I'm pretty sure an email can go through the internet. If I believe in a God who created the universe, I'm pretty sure he can break the physical laws of the universe he created right? 
Jesus can come back from the dead, he can feed us. It's not a metaphor. He literally did it. That's why they want to make an army. They didn't say, wow, what a metaphorical, beautiful story about loving each other. Let's form an army. <laughs> you see, the point of the story, and really the whole story of the Bible, right, is that you and I, we're like the people in the crowd. Uh, maybe there are a few really sanctified among us who are like Andrew, who are like, well, Lord, just take what I can give you. But the whole point about being tested and going through trials is to learn to be dependent on the one who actually does pass the test, who actually does endure the trial. You see, Jesus is on a mountain, and people try to take him by force, by king. But in just a few chapters later, Jesus will be on another mountain, and more people will come to take him by force. But they will not come to make him king. They will come to crucify him. Yeah, they'll call him king, but they'll make a crown of thorns on his head. And they'll put a sign that says, king of the Jews, right? Isn't that who you are? And people will mock him and beat him. See, the hope that you and I have, Christian, is not that we have the emotional power or the wherewithal or the strength or the fortitude to pass the test. It's not in you, and I think you know that. Our great hope in Christ is that Jesus passed the test. He knows what it's like to be ultimately rejected, ultimately abandoned. His disciples abandon him on the mountain, and he endures a literal trial. He is found guilty, even though he did nothing wrong. And he died the death that our sin deserved. And three days later, he literally came back from the dead. And he says, all you have to do to be made right, to have peace, to have purpose, to become who you are, is receive my love. Believe in me. Believe in him whom he has sent. So Christian, the great hope that you have to face the trial, um, it's not going to be on Google. It's not going to be on WebMD. Um, it's not going to be in a parenting book. The great hope is that the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, who has overcome everything for us, dwells within you. And your job is to make sure your spirit is beating at the heartbeat of the Spirit of God within you. It's learning to be dependent, seeing your tests and your trials and your sufferings, not as opportunities to learn more, but to be drawn closer to Jesus. Do you know how to pass a test? <laughs> Are you the kind of person that knows how to pass a test? Are you good at those? Uh, friends, this is an invitation to let Jesus pass the test for you. Let's pray. Now, Father, as we uh, enter into the holiday season, uh, Lord, where old wounds can come back so quickly and so painfully, uh, Father, we pray for your grace. We pray that your Holy Spirit would forgive through us, that we would have hope, that we would turn to Jesus who passed the test for us, and would his spirit empower us to be the people you have made us to be. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Oh, come let us adore.